Hello everybody and uh, welcome to another video sponsored by Lumix. I'm just making sure that I'm in focus. And typically when I do this at the start of a video, I look at myself in the, the screen and think I should really start paying a bit more attention to my appearance in these videos at some point. I mean, not a lot, it's not a beauty contest as you well know, but uh, I should at least make sure that I don't look like I've been sleeping in a farmyard. Uh, but luckily today's not about me, it's about beginner photographers and what you shouldn't buy if you're a beginner photographer uh, at the start of the process of just getting into photography. Now I have had, uh, I don't know, two or three emails a week ever since I started this channel from people who are just starting out in photography and they ask me things like, James, would you buy X or Y in order to improve your photography the fastest? And typically my response is, I wouldn't buy X or Y, I'd buy W. Not W, what's the other axis that mathematicians use? Z? Is it Z? And uh, yeah, so the hope is that after today I'll just be able to send people to this video as opposed to typing out specific responses to uh, each of those questions and hopefully that'll be useful. And if you're just watching this video randomly from YouTube then hopefully you find it useful too. So all of the things I'm going to talk about today are things that people have suggested that they're considering buying when they're just starting out in photography and I don't think any of them are a good idea and I'm going to explain why. That's the plan. Right, first thing I don't think is a good idea to spend money on when you're just starting out is Filters. Now these are tiny little filters. Uh, these are 46 millimeter thread filters for some of my tiny little micro four thirds primes. Very, very dusty because uh, I hardly ever use them. Which makes it a bit strange that people ask me about it all the time, but I guess they don't know that. I don't really use filters. Um, now there are a number of different kinds of filters, loads of different kinds of filters to be honest, and there are a few that I think are the least worthwhile investing in. Starting with graduated filters. Now graduated filters, you might have seen them in the past, I don't have any with me. I mean I've never bought any so I can't show you. I should have probably bought some for this video but never mind. But graduated filters, as you may expect, kind of graduate. A lot of them are sort of dark at the top and then gradually they become clear. Or they might be frosted at the top and then become clear. Basically there'll be a difference between the top and the bottom of those filters so that, for example, if you want to darken the sky, you can put the dark bit over the sky and the clear bit over the land and then you'll have a dark sky but a perfectly exposed bit of land as well. That's the theory behind them. Done an absolutely terrible job of explaining that. But the reason that they're not a particularly good idea if you're new to photography is that it's very easy to achieve a very similar effect in uh, post-processing, in Lightroom or in Photoshop and therefore you can do exactly the same thing for free without spending money on filters, providing you already have the, the editing software, which I've kind of assumed people have, they, they might not. Now, of course, after a year or two of taking photos, if you decide that you'd much prefer to try and get that effect uh, in camera or with a filter over your lens, then at that point it makes sense to buy filters. But until you know that's the case, you're just sort of guessing that that's, that's the route that you're going to go. You may well find that you prefer to have more control over it in post-production. And uh, if that's the case, well, you'll, you'll save yourself some money on filters. Uh, another kind of filter that I don't think are a particularly good idea to uh, invest in when you first start out or ever, really, actually, to be honest, uh, is a UV filter, which typically these days is used mostly for protection of the front element of the lens. And the reason I don't think these are a good idea, particularly if you buy expensive lenses, is that you're undoubtedly gonna have an effect on image quality if you put another bit of glass, particularly a cheap bit of glass, over the top of that lens. It just doesn't make any sense to me. Instead, for protection, what I do, keep a lens hood on. And that means that if you drop your camera on a rock, for example, you're gonna have to be quite unlucky for the camera to land in such a way that the, uh, the rock can get into the front element of the lens when the lens hood is in the way. Very unlucky, in fact, it's never happened to me. And when you use a lens hood, you, um, you don't get any degradation in image quality. You have to be careful with lens hoods when it's windy because, I mean, they can act as a bit of a parachute. But aside from that, they're brilliant for protecting your lens. Um, a couple of other filter types that I think are a bit more worthwhile spending money on when you're first starting out are a polarizer. Now, if you've seen uh, polarizing before, I've done a video on polarization, um, then that's really an effect that's quite difficult, if not impossible, to achieve in post-production. And therefore, having a polarizer can be a good idea because, uh, well, like I said, you can't you can't achieve it any other way. This is this is what a polarizer looks like. I don't know why I'm turning it. You're probably not getting any polarization effect. But yeah, if you don't know what polarizing is, go and watch this video. And another kind of filter which might be worth investing in at the start, actually, um, if you decide from the start that you're really interested in achieving long exposures, is a super super dark neutral density filter like this one. So this is ND. 1000. So yeah, I'm really not a fan of long exposures to be honest, but if you know from the off 
that you're really going to be into learning about long exposure photography, then you might want to invest in, in something like this to, uh, to help you do so. Because if you want to shoot in bright light, then there's no real choice but to, uh, to use one of these to get really, really slow shutter speeds. But on the whole, I'd say that filters aren't the best thing to uh, invest in when you're just starting out your journey because they're not for everyone. They're not used universally. In fact, they're quite a niche product in photography, to be honest. They're quite extensively used on YouTube because there's lots of landscape photographers who love to use them. But generally, they're not that popular. And uh, for lots of people there, they're not all that including me. Next up, probably the product I get asked about most by beginner photographers is a drone. Now there isn't a day goes by where I fly this and I'm not just utterly amazed at what it can do. I mean, it's ridiculous that this technology exists and is available to, uh, well, people like me. And to be honest, it's an amazing photographic tool as well. It's incredible what this can do, the positions that it can get in and the perspective that it can give you relative to what other cameras can do. However, if you're going out for a full day, for example, and uh, you're not going anywhere where you can charge batteries, then even if you have a spare battery for a drone like this, the maximum time you're gonna be able to spend flying around is an hour, which sounds like a long time, but compared to say eight or nine hours that you can have with a conventional camera, it's not that long to be practicing taking photos. And all the same rules for photography apply with a drone as they do to a normal camera. The same composition rules, the same color theory rules, the same exposure rules, the same aperture rules, all the same kind of stuff you can learn on a conventional camera and uh, you can learn a lot faster than you would be able to with a drone, particularly when you consider how much money you have to plow into one of these to get one and what you could get for that with a conventional camera or lenses. So yeah, this is a great piece of kit, but even if you think that in future, uh, aerial photography is one of the things you're gonna be most interested in, I would suggest that it's best that you spend your money on conventional kit and uh, learn with that first, learn the basics of photography first before you start worrying about getting great photos with a drone. Because if you don't know how to get good photos with a normal camera, you're still gonna struggle to get good photos with a drone. And actually that's becoming truer all the time because more and more people are getting drones and uh, the photos from them are becoming less unique. And so unlike when these first came out a few years ago, not all drone photos that you see are impressive anymore because there are so many of them. So you need to learn your photography skills before you can take good photos with drones. And also, as I said in Italy a couple of weeks back in one of the vlogs, I, I never feel as good when I take photos with a drone as I do when I take photos with a conventional camera. And I think that's largely because there's a disconnect between you and the drone, a very obvious disconnect between you and the drone when it's taking photos. I mean, it's probably a few hundred feet in the air and you're on the ground not actually seeing what the drone is seeing. So you don't really feel the same connection to a photo as you do when you're stood right behind the camera and uh, getting the same view that the camera's getting. And for that reason, this doesn't inspire me as much as a normal camera. Uh, it doesn't get me as excited as a normal camera. And uh, I find myself using it less and less for photography as uh, as time goes on, to be honest. I just use it for bits of B-roll here and there nowadays. Uh, carbon fiber tripods is, is the next thing I wanna talk about. Now I have pretty much waged war on tripods on this channel. I've said multiple times, hundreds of times maybe, that I'm not the biggest fan of them. I hate tripods, I hate them. What I am a fan of is the law of diminishing returns, which basically says that the more you spend, the less you get relative to each pound that you spend. I don't know what that was. And I do think with tripods, well, I just can't believe the price of some of the top end ones, to be honest. I mean, yeah, I'm sure they're, you know, space grade carbon fiber, but ultimately they're three legs of metal. That's all they are. And similar to filters, really, I'd say with carbon fiber tripods or expensive tripods or even moderately expensive tripods, make sure that you're gonna use them before you spend money on them. And the only way to do that is to photograph for a year or two and think about all the times where you could have done with a tripod before you spend loads of money on one. Because I hear from so many people who say that their tripod just collects dust in, uh, in their closet. And if that's gonna be the case for you, then I hope that the tripod that you did buy wasn't a super expensive one. And again, it may be that after a year or two of taking photos, you decide that every single photo that you want to take, you want to use a tripod to do so. And if that's the case, spend your budget on a tripod. But until that point, don't do it, because again, it could just be, could just be dead money. Four, bit of a strange one this, to be honest, or I thought it was until I got asked about it a lot. Um, Narbox, basically, if you've not heard of this, what it is, is, um, 
how do I explain what this is? It's like a little computer, a little storage computer. So you pop your, your SD card in there from your camera and it loads all the footage onto a hard drive here, which you then can connect to your iPad or your phone and you can play around with the files and control them and even edit the files on here. It's like a little laptop without a screen basically for your files and lots of people ask if they should uh, invest in one of these and the answer is yes if you're taking photos that you're really happy with which I assume you're not going to be doing if uh, you're in the first year or two of your photography. I mean you might be taking photos you're happy with actually but the chances are that you're not going to be happy with those photos for much after when you've taken them. Because typically when you start in photography, like anything, your rate of progression is very, very fast. And so if you take a photo in the first six months that you love, chances are that three months after that, you're gonna have progressed to a point where you now think that that photo is actually a bit rubbish. So when that's the case, spending money on storage of photos that you're not gonna think are worthwhile in not that long a period of time, is not a sensible investment, I don't think. This thing is amazing, I really, really like it, and I'll do a bit more of a focused video on it at some point, but uh, it's not a good thing to spend money on when you're just starting out, I don't think. You'd be much better off spending your money elsewhere. Same goes for these little SSDs, which are amazing hard drives, tiny, tiny little hard drives, as you can see, but um, yeah, you don't need to be all that protective of your files when your files are not gonna uh, stand the test of time, which is likely to be the case in 99% of examples I think. Uh, next up, fancy cleaning kits. A lot of people ask me what they should get to clean their photography gear. And I've been sent links of cleaning kits which are a lot of money and I think it's ridiculous. All I've ever had to clean my gear, and I can't see it at the moment, but I've had one of those blower things, and I do pretty much everything else with my t-shirt. And uh, I'm really not that precious about it. I mean, lots of these lenses have tough coatings on them, which means that wiping off dust with a t-shirt is, is not gonna scratch the surface if you'll pardon the pun. Um, next up, calibrator. Now I bought a calibrator once, a monitor calibrator to uh, correct the colors. And I used it once on a monitor and then I put it in a drawer and then I never used it again. Lots of people talk to me about calibrators, but actually I think to be honest, they're a bit of a waste of time. I mean, I edit my images on an iMac or a really old MacBook Pro that's got like some sort of weird mildew thing on the screen. If anyone knows what that looks like, please let me know. This stuff here, what is that? Um, I've got a Google phone and on all those devices, my images look a little bit different and uh, I've just sort of accepted it, to be honest. I mean, if you share your images online, then hopefully lots of people will see them. And if lots of people see them, they'll be looking at them on lots of different devices and screens. And so they're gonna look different anyway. I mean, I do a lot of printing and if I don't like the colors in one of my prints, then I'll tweak them in Lightroom or something and, and that'll be that. Uh, but I'm not concerned enough about it to make sure that my monitor is 100% color accurate or anything because I just don't think anyone really cares. Basically, if your photo's good, your photo's good. And just because your monitor's not calibrated doesn't mean it's not gonna get praise. Uh, a couple more, loop deck. So I've had a number of emails over the past, I don't know, six months or so about a product called loop deck, which I had to look up, to be honest. And uh, basically, it looks quite cool, actually. It's like a little, it's not a keyboard, it's more like a, a DJ, what would you call it? Like mixer, where you can turn like knobs and stuff to uh, to adjust sliders in Lightroom. Looks pretty cool. I don't actually see how it has all that much of a purpose. I mean, it might kind of improve your workflow a bit, but when you're just starting out in photography, does that matter? Not really. I'd prefer to see you spend that money on a trip or a lens or something that's actively gonna help you take more or different photos, as opposed to something that just sort of changes the way you edit photos a bit. I don't think that's a good investment at all. Until you get to a point where you might decide down the line that it, it is useful, but not at the start. And last one, L bracket. So lots of people ask me about L brackets. Again, I don't really know why, because I've never ever used one. Basically an L bracket is a, a bracket that's the shape of an L that you connect to your camera, which means it's, it's easier, slightly easier to mount both in landscape and portrait orientation on a tripod. And uh, basically I don't think that's a good investment either, because until you know that you're gonna use a tripod a lot, you might just find that it gets in the way with your handheld shots. I mean, you're gonna make your camera heavier. It's gonna mean that you can't use any sort of clip. It's just, it's not a good idea unless you know for sure that you're gonna be using a tripod for an awful lot of your shots. And if you're not, then that's, that's not a good thing to spend money on. Basically, what I would suggest when you're just starting out is uh, to spend money on three particular things. Um, a camera, a camera that you're, you're happy with, a camera that you're satisfied with, uh, some good lenses. I did a lens buyer's guide that you can check out here. And what else? 
Uh, travel, going to places that you think you'd like to take photos. That's what I would spend money on because basically all those things will have a direct impact on how many photos you take. And anything else is just wasted money at the start, I think. Um, yeah, so I think you should prioritise things that um, help you take more photos. I've said that about a million times now, I think. Uh, yeah, so thanks very much for watching and thank you to Lumix for sponsoring this video. One thing I would say about cameras and lenses when you're just starting out in photography is that if your budget stretches to it, shop for a camera like this G9, which has got weather sealing. And the reason for that is quite clear. If you've got weather sealing, then you're not gonna be worried about taking your camera out in the rain, which means you can shoot more, practice more, and get better more quickly. And uh, you might be watching this from somewhere that's really dry. You might not live in a place where it rains a lot, in which case, lucky you, but also, typically in my experience, places that are dry can be quite dusty. And typically cameras that are weather sealed are splash proof, but also dust proof. And uh, well, yeah, the seals just help keep dust out, which which can help improve the, uh, the lifetime of your camera. So uh, yeah, I'd just look out for those. And if your budget stretches to it, get lenses and cameras that are splash and dust proof uh, would be my advice because um, they just mean that you can use your camera a lot more. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time. Hopefully that was useful. If you can think of anything else that you've uh, heard other photographers or you've considered yourself buying when you're a beginner and you're glad you didn't or you thought it was a waste of money when you did, uh, if you could let me know in the comments or let other people know in the comments, that'd be very helpful. And I'll, uh, I'll see you soon.